the questions raised by the committee. If present wishes to speak, the following may then address the committee for no more than three minutes each. A person, a spokesperson representing any objector to the application, by now you need to identify the single spokesperson, and if, and if more than one objector wishes to speak, the time will be divided accordingly between within the three minutes time slot. Followed by the applicant or the agent, Indeed, followed by a spokesperson representing any supporter of the application who live within 100 metres of the development site. And last but not least, uh, a ward councillor representing the area affected by the proposer. proposal. Each speaker should restrict their comments to the planning aspect of the proposal and should avoid repeating information which is already in the report. The meeting is not a hearing where participants uh, present evidence to be cross-examined by other participants. At the end of each representation, the committee may ask questions of the presenter. Speakers should lead the committee on subject in which they would welcome further questioning. Ward, ward members in attendance and those nominated to speak on behalf of objectors, supporters and applicants may be asked to make further brief contributions in case any issues need to be clarified after addressing the meeting. Now, this is not an opportunity to take part in the debate of the committee. After receiving all submissions, the committee will debate the applications and consider the recommendations. Now, this is a council committee meeting which is open to the public, but there should be no interruptions from members of the public. And finally, I would like everyone present to know that although the planning committee comprises members of different political parties, we are not politically whipped. Our decisions are made in accordance with the Council's planning policy and based on the information contained in the relevant reports, together with the consultation responses and any verbal submissions made today. How we approach this application set out in the development management report at item eight, and if members are happy to note that report, I will move on to considering the planning applications. I assume you are content. Thank you very much, thank you. Yes, Chair. Thank you. I'll now move on to item 8.1, which is the Daisy Business Park, which is 19 to 35 Sylvan Grove, London SE 15 1PD. And of course, members, these are pages 44 to 176 of the main agenda pack and pages 1 to 5 of the agenda, of the agenda report. Now, um, can I, can I, um, um, can I, um, also invite the office, uh, forgive me um, on this, just making sure. Can I ask the office to consider a report um, to, to, to introduce and make your presentation? Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Wing Lau, team leader, and I shall be presenting this case. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. With you. Oh, oh, forgive me, Wing, whilst oh. you're doing that, I, I suppose I should just make the observation just for the committee, mind committee, and for those who are listening, that the, that the committee started hearing this item um, uh, at the meeting on the 8th of September, and it was agreed to adjourn it, to allow for further discussion to take place. Now, following on from the annual meeting on the 16th of September, there were changes to the composition of this committee, so it's been decided that this application will now be heard afresh, just so that uh, this is to clarify why we're now here on this item afresh. So he go ahead, with you. thank you. Thank you. Can you see this? We can. Okay, we can. thank you. Um, yeah, as, as the chair pointed out, this was heard at the planning committee on the 8th of September, and that was, uh, but it's now being treated as deferred, and it's now being brought before members for determination. So you, some of the members have seen this presentation before, but I'll start again. But before I start, I'd just like to highlight that there was an addendum report issued today that details the discussions between applicant, Veolia and officers. And the condition has been proposed by the applicant and that's been accepted by Veolia. And they have confirmed in writing that they no longer wish to object to the scheme. And it also details a late objection received from the Southwark Law Centre, which wasn't reported in the main committee report or the last addendum report. Um, but uh, is now in the, uh, the supplements issued today, supplemental agenda submitted today. Um, basically, Southwark Law Centre raised the point that major developments should be real carbon zero, meaning that there should be no payments into a carbon offset fund by developers. And um, I will address that in my presentation. Now, the application, application site is known as Stacey Business Park. 
in the Old Kent Road opportunity area and the site is accessed off Sylvan Grove and is within the mixed residential, industrial and commercial area. The existing two-storey building currently provides B1 class uses with a car parking forecourt and the, the site also adjoins a development site to the south and west known as the Devonshire Square or Devonshire Grove Development, which members gave resolution to grant planning permission for 565 homes and employment, community and retail uses. And to the north of that site is the integrated waste management facility operated by Veolia. And to the east is the recently built residential flats at 8 to 24 Sylvan Grove, also known as Hyde Housing Scheme. Um, this is so there, there are the uh, photos of the existing site. This is a view of the car park from Sylvan Grove. And as you can see here, there's a gas holder in the background. And the image on the right is looking north on Sylvan Grove, which is a cul-de-sac with 8 to 24 Sylvan Grove on the um, one side of the road and the waste management facility in the background. In terms of policy designation, it's located within the Opportunity Area Sub-Area 4 and specifically Proposal Site OKR18. It is also within the Strategic Industrial Location, or SIL, and also in the Action Area Core. It's within an Urban Density Zone and an archaeology, Archaeological Priority Zone and also within the Air Quality Management Area. And it should be noted that in emerging use of the plan, the site is no longer protected as SIL. And the, proposed, the maps propose the release of that site from the SIL to allow for provision of new homes mixed with commercial uses. And the 2017 version of the draft AAP indicative master plan on the right shows no open space proposed on this site in that earlier draft version. And the site is not within the conservation area. And you can see the grade two listed gas holder uh, nearby to the northwest of the site. This is just an image of the development, which would be formed by three main components, and the building would be part two, part five, and part 32 storeys arranged on an L-shaped footprint, wrapping around a new public open space. And in summary, the scheme uh, is a mixed-use development for B1 commercial and, and uh, residential flats, and I'll explain those uses and quantum later. So in terms of public consultation, uh, there were five objections in total and three letters of support that were received. And as I noted in the addendum, there was a second letter from Veolia and the Southwark Law Centre, uh, which was received since the publication of the main report in September. So the main issues raised from all the consultation responses are the density of the height of the building. Um, there were some comments about existing vacant buildings could be restored for future businesses. There was a comment about provision of electric vehicle charging points. And there were questions about the capacity for infrastructure. Um, and then there were concerns over the potential impact of the scheme on Veolia's operation and not following the agent of change principle. And the comment about uh, the scheme should be zero carbon and there should be no in new payment uh, 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 available. So these issues are recorded and addressed in the main report and addendum. In addition to the commercial uses proposed, a total of 219 new dwellings are proposed. At least 35% of that would be affordable, and that's provided within a total of 59 affordable dwellings and would be made up of a policy compliant offer of social and intermediate units. And this slide shows the distribution of the different tenures, and the scheme is tenure blind with a shared entrance and lobby for the private and affordable units. And the design quality of the building means that you can't really distinguish between the tenures. And all of the three bedroom units would be in the affordable tenure, offering different types and sizes with a few being large, three bedroom, six person flats, which is very welcomed. So this is just a general site layout showing a building proposed an L-shaped footprint and the public open space designed as a garden square. The development would provide just under 3,000 square metres of B1 um, floor space on the lower floors of the development and there would also be 10% of affordable workspace as required by policy and the car park and servicing area is located to the rear access of Sylvan Grove. And there's also an internal communal amenity space shaded in purple located on the ground floor for all residents to use, which could also be open up to be uh, for other community events or meetings by the local tenants residents associations. So looking at the land use issues, um, introducing housing here would represent a departure from the adopted plan. And members need to consider whether the wider regeneration benefits of the scheme would outweigh any of the harm caused and therefore justify a departure from the adopted planning policy. So those benefits are discussed in my report, um, but just to highlight the main points, the AAP places the site within the proposed action area core, 
and also within proposal site OKR 18. That proposal site stipulates that development must replace existing employment space and provide residential above and provide a new public square off Devonshire Grove. The scheme would provide for an uplift in employment floor space, including a guaranteed minimum of um, B1 light industrial use, and that increases the number of jobs on the site. And the 10% quality affordable workspace would also meet policy and the provision of housing and policy compliant affordable housing above would also deliver the aspirations of the AAP and the local plan. And in terms of transport impacts, it has been assessed that the trip generation of the scheme will not harm the local highway network. Um, the proposed development would essentially be car free bar the six disabled uh, parking bays for the residents and um, servicing and deliveries for the proposed development would uh, largely be undertaken on site at the ground level from within the undercroft parking and servicing area. And the scheme would provide the policy compliant cycle spaces for both residential and commercial uses on the first floor level. So all, the, of all of the residential flats are within the tallest block. This is just a typical floor layout on levels two to five within the main tower. And in my report, I say that the density of the scheme is above the range for the urban density zone, but it is within the um, core area. And the scheme has demonstrated exemplary design and providing good quality of accommodation. And those are set out in the main report. They all meet and in some cases exceed the minimum room and flat sizes. And they would all have good levels of daylight and sunlight. Uh, with no more than eight flats sharing court on each floor and they would, would have um, adequate outlook and adequate privacy distances within the scheme and each flat would have private amenity space in the form of balconies or winter gardens um, and in total 116 units would be um, dual aspects but as I say in my report that um, all of these units would have very good outlook um, with views out onto the new square and none of the single aspect units would be north facing only. Uh, members raised questions on the provision of open space and play space on that night of the last committee, which officers had responded to. And in summary, the proposed development would deliver public open space of approximately 700 square metres. And it's essentially an extension to the public open space proposed next door in the Devonshire Square site. That's coloured in grey here. And communal garden space is provided on the roof of the lower block building and it's accessible to all the tenures. Um, but the total communal amenity space provision will fall short of the standards, so there will be an in-lieu payment that could go towards the provision of a new park space elsewhere in the plan area, uh, including the new Lifsey Park. The play space is provided in the communal roof terrace and um, a larger playable open space within the new public square, giving um, total children's play space that would meet the play space requirement. And the proposed approach to dedicated play space provision has been to maximize doorstep play for the under fives on the site that's in line with the mayor's SPG. Um, but it's also possible that some areas could provide for older children on site, such as table tennis and other facilities within the communal uh, room. So the playable environment would um, have design elements have play value and that would benefit people of all ages in the neighbourhood, including spaces for quiet enjoyment, as well as places to be active and allows interaction between people. And the playable open space as per the GLA guidance is therefore multifunctional and the design of the landscaping would be secured by condition. But this slide just shows the other three areas of open spaces um, and play spaces approved at Devonshire Square development. Um, we've got the Devonshire Square, the larger square here, and you've got Sylvan Greens and what was this called a Sylvan Gardens, the garden square um, approved in the Devonshire Square site. So the open space strategy for Devonshire Square was also to include playable space within those areas of open space, like the current scheme here. And the area joining Daisy Business Park is what is named Sylvan Gardens. Um, and just to iterate, the 2017 AAP master plan had no requirement for public open space on this particular site at Daisy Business Park, but it's following public consultation on the plan and engagement with the applicant and the neighboring developers that this has been amended. And the master plan shows provision of public open space, which also benefit the residents of um, Sylvan Grove at eight to 24. So this application would therefore be providing that space in line with the revised master plan. There is an overall shortfall in the provision of public open space, but the garden square would be one larger space once both developments are complete. And this application would deliver about two thirds of this new Sylvan gardens. Um, so in total, there'll be over a thousand square meters of open space from the two developments and those details of the landscaping can be um, secured. 
So the future aspiration is to provide linkages and networks of green spaces across the opportunity area. And this scheme would help to deliver that, improving the permeability across this part of the opportunity area. And of course, the new improved uh, paving and links into and out of the site provide other kinds of public realm benefits. So this table just shows the various open space requirements, provision and where it may fall short. So there will be an in lieu payment for the communal amenity space and public open space shortfall. So the draft AAP identifies the site as an appropriate location for a tier three building of a building up to 16 storeys. So the, although the proposed building exceeds what was previously drafted in the AAP, at 32 storeys, this is considered in the context of changes to the AAP master plan, which includes the creation of the new public open space on Sylvan Grove. And then the tallest building proposed on Devonshire Square site would be up to 39 storeys in height. So the proposal here would be seen in the context of the adjoining development and it's been demonstrated in the submission that the building will not adversely impact on the local or borough views or the setting of nearby heritage assets. So in terms of architecture and design, the building would be of masonry character, um, employing terracotta cladding and brick, uh, referencing the solidity and robustness of the existing architecture found in the area. And in keeping with the principles of the AAP for taller buildings in the area, a strong vertical emphasis adopted throughout with a base, middle and the crown. So the increased floor to ceiling heights of the ground and first floors um, helps to enliven and celebrate the base of the building and its entrances. And as you move up the facades of the, um, from the brick base, the materials and textures will vary, but there'll be a consistent color tone and um, the quality of these materials will be secured by planning conditions. This slide just shows the committed schemes in the surrounding area with the Devonshire Square scheme shown in purple. The applicant has carried out daylight and sunlight assessment. And as I noted in the report that, that there will be some reductions in daylight and sunlight to neighboring property, eight to 24 Sylvan Grove. But this is a degree, to a degree, a consequence of the design of the existing building, including the presence of deep side returns, overhanging balconies and recesses. And, but other neighboring properties will not be significantly impacted by the development. And the outlook and privacy of all the existing residential units would also not be adversely affected. The distance between the proposed tower and that approved at Devonshire Square is at least 18 metres, but just to note that the distance here is to the private balcony and not to window. And Southwark's own residential design standards, SPD, recommends that there should be 21 metres distance between windows to the rear of the property and 12 metres across a highway. But there can be some deviation from that guidance if justified or mitigation measures are in place to limit overlooking. So in this distance, whilst um, it doesn't you know, strictly speaking, doesn't meet the required recommended guidance of 21 meters. The towers are designed so they do not have habitable rooms that directly overlook each other, and the windows are slightly offset. Um, and looking at microclimate, the applicant had tested the effects of wind, both as a standalone scenario and cumulatively with the Devonshire Square scheme. And members had previously sought advice on the effects of wind on the upper floors. But the criteria used in assessment widely used in wind microclimate studies applies to ground level conditions because there are no defined criteria for the required levels of comfort on private balconies on upper floor levels. And the wind is often more intense around the base of tall buildings. The cumulative effects are beneficial to the ground levels as the Devonshire Square Tower provides some screening to the main public area at ground floor and amenity space on the roof terrace. In terms of sustainability, the carbon dioxide savings exceed the on-site target set for domestic and non-domestic uses. And the renewable energy sources would come from PV panels and air source heat pumps on site. So this plan just shows the PVs located on the roof of the tallest block. Um, the scheme has prioritized carbon savings by achieving by almost 70% site-wide carbon reduction, which is considered to be very good. And it's one of the highest achieving level to date in the Old Kent Road area. And on top of this design of the scheme and the energy strategy that it would reduce energy bills for the future residents and officers consider this to be a benefit of the scheme but as it does fall short of carbon zero there will be a carbon offset payment and the late observation from southern law center received point out that major developments should be truly carbon zero with no offset payment from uh, by developers but just to note that the um 
most up-to-date development plan on um, energy and is the uh, London plan and even the latest draft new London plan policies on energy is that major development proposals should demonstrate how the net car zero carbon target will be met but it just requires a minimum of 35 percent of carbon dioxide savings against building regulations and any shortfall being made up of the offset payment and this application would therefore meet that policy and this is something that's seen across um, in, in other London boroughs and also within Southwark. In terms of environmental impacts such as noise and air quality, the application submission demonstrates that with appropriate mitigation measures, any potential impacts would be minimised. Um, and in terms of potential impacts on the adjoining waste management facility, the noise impact assessment and odour assessment has been undertaken and the Environmental Protection Officer has reviewed this and considers this scheme to be acceptable with those appropriate mitigation measures in place. And as I mentioned at the start of the presentation, there is an additional condition added and Viola considers this to satisfy their concerns. So overall, the scheme would mean that it would be a good quality of accommodation and that it would follow the agent of um, change principle. So I've just come to the end of my presentation now and just to summarise and highlight the main points is that the development would result in a, um, the departure of the adopted plan but members know that Old Kent Road is an opportunity area and that would undergo significant transformation with substantial growth including new housing and I've already highlighted those, those regeneration benefits that this scheme would bring. It would increase the number of jobs on the site um, and including affordable workspace, the delivery of new housing and affordable housing and, and those um, units would have good quality of accommodation. There'll be a new public accessible park with associated public realm, and that, that would improve permeability across the site. Those potential impacts identified are not considered to be significant to adverse impact on neighboring residents' immunity or hinder future operations of the adjoining waste transfer station. So the building height and design would sit well with the approved Devonshire Square development and cycle and car parking levels are acceptable. So officers have therefore recommended the planning permission be granted subject to condition referral to the Mayor of London and the completion of a Section 106 legal agreement. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Um, can, can, can our members wish to ask questions of Wing? I don't see any members indicating. Oh, Councillor Livingstone, just go ahead. I, I note that Councillor Whittam, I think, was even faster off off the oh. mark than I was, if you wanted oh, to go there first, yeah. Uh, uh, Councillor Mittam, I didn't see your hand, but never mind. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, you keep ignoring those digital oh. hands. <laughs> oh, right. I can't actually see a digital hand in your case, but anyway, go ahead. Um, I don't want to sound like a broken record. I brought oh. this up the last one, but I just putting down my marker to say I think we're 700 square meters short of um, the required amount of money for the in lieu payment so whatever 700 square meters times two I think it's 208 I think that's the minimum that our um, in lieu payment should be, which is well over another 100,000. I would prefer it to have the um, correct amount of space. So although this isn't a question, I just didn't want to go past this point without registering my displeasure. You keep bringing in the Devonshire Grove um, spaces when they were counted towards the requirement for the Devonshire Square. So to keep bringing them up and saying, oh, it'll be a thousand square meters instead of 700 square meters, it's irrelevant, it's okay. irrelevant. Okay. Can I admit them? We've, we've got you, we've got you that. Um, oh, we may wish to comment uh, what you've said, it's just for clarity's sake. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I think, what I'm saying is that um, the thousand square meters isn't, you know, going towards the, you know, doesn't, it's not counted in the application. It's over in my assessment, but it's just when you look at it, this um, overall that this scheme actually provides two thirds of that Oak Sylvan Gardens, and uh, the significant benefit is that it comes together as a one one big space. And as I've mentioned before, that it is playable open space, um, and it's, you know. It, it, as per the GLA guidance, that playable open space is um, 
sometimes recommended, in, especially in public spaces, because that allows for integration of the community um, and helps with, you know, current problems of social isolation that, you know, and gets the community to get together. And um, as I said before, the 2017 Integrative Master Plan had no requirement for open space on the site, and it would have required to uh, pay an in-lieu payment anyway. But in this instance, they provided some form of open space with playable open space. Um, that's Thank you. my comment. Thank you. No, thank you, Wing. Thank you very much. Can no, I no, just say? So no, 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 no. Hold on, Councillor Britton. Forgive me. Well, I'll, I'll say it at the end then. Uh, that's right. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Livingstone. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I, it's it's on a similar topic. Uh, I. I mean, I, I, I can see the benefit of, of stitching together the, 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 total, uh, the total area as was described, and I think that square could be quite beneficial, but as noted, they're still having to make uh, an, an in-lieu payment. Um, uh, Wing mentioned the potential for that to be spent at the proposed Livesey Park, which is less than 200 metres away from this site. And I just wondered what the scope was was to condition that and uh, whether officers felt that was a desirable thing to do so first of all can we do it and two should we do it oh yeah, i was just going to just give an example where money could be spent i'm not committing that that what we get from the new payment will definitely spent on um losing park but it's something that could go towards um and maybe colin could go uh, talk about it if he wanted to but um, usually we collect there will be an in-lieu payment and then it'll be um, depending then we can then decide where it can go. I mean, to, 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 to answer your, your question Councillor Livingston uh, yes we could um, secure a commitment to that through the um, through uh, through the 106 to be paid up to, to go to that park in particular it would make sense to do that um, it's going to be uh, the large uh, one of the largest park spaces that we create so uh you know it's, it's not it's not it's not to say that some um, if something else came forward in in the interim um you know perhaps with a discussion with ward councillors we might we might spend it elsewhere but um but in the first instance yes we could commit commit to it being for the livesey park space thank you i think i think that'd be a good idea given it is going to be so close to this development and uh, given the short put fall in in space that we've been talking about on site Thank you, Councillor Livingstone. Um, Councillor Dan Whitehead. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a sort of related question, but more focused on density. Um, and I note from the report, paragraph 140 of the main agenda, that it states that the expected density range in the urban zone would be 200 to 700 habitable rooms per hectare, whereas the actual development in this case is approximately 2,502 rooms per hectare, which is at a minimum level over three times the density that is suggested for an area of this, uh, uh, an urban zone. Um, I also note that paragraph 141 states that um, the development as a whole would have a density of approximately 2,502 hectares, uh, rooms per hectare, including the commercial floor space and it should be noted that whilst this represents a higher density development above the typical range of set out in the policy, the draft new London plan intends to delete reference to any density matrix and replace it with reliance on improved design approaches focusing on design quality and urban greening. So I was wondering if the officer could outline precisely why this particular um, application includes, how it includes high levels of design quality and urban greening, particularly given that the urban greening proportion as we've just heard is below what would be expected. Um, sorry, could you repeat that first question? Councillor? I think it's, it's one question, oh. which is in what way can you justify or are you justifying that the density here, which is over three times the maximum threshold according to planning policy um, is, is um, something that is, is appropriate particularly given in the report, it's saying that the focus of the new London plan and the reasons for why it is appropriate are the design quality and urban greening. Okay. Do, do you want me to come out on that wing? Yeah, okay, fine, Colin. Okay, um, uh, yes, yeah, so um, uh, there, are, there are a number of things um, which uh, 
drive up the density. One of them is a desire to increase employment in the Old Kent Road and deliver affordable workspace in the Old Kent Road. Um, so that tends to drive the density up uh, on the site overall. Um, the other thing that we look at is uh, the extent to which this is delivered um, in accordance with a wider master plan um, and what the proximity of this scheme is to plan parks in the area. So rather than consider this just within its own red line um, and um, consider that density in complete isolation, we, all, we also have in mind the new spaces being created on neighbouring sites uh, and in particular, as um, Councillor Livingston pointed out, uh, the new park which is based around the listed gas holder uh, on the gasworks site which we own the majority of so we we are in control of delivering that that um, that park space uh, and um, the other consideration obviously is is um, uh, both the quality of um, internal uh, accommodation um, within the flats which we think um, is good uh, and the, the 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 final consideration would be well what, what is the quality of the environment which is there at the moment uh, and at the moment the the residents of the um, Southern Grove scheme who are council um, uh, tenants uh, look at a car park uh, and um, there is a single tree in Sylvan Grove so Sylvan Grove is probably a bit of a misnomer uh, there is one mature um, lime tree which survives in Sylvan Grove which is being kept um, in, in redevelopment and, and that Sylvan Grove um, has this new space. Um, it has tree planting, including keeping the, the existing um, lime tree. And uh, it transforms that environment really from, from, from what it is now um, to, to something which we think um, will be a genuine improvement, uh, both for existing residents and for new residents. And yes, it is, it is a high density, um, but as well as being within 200 meters of the park, it's also within 150 meters um, of a new tube station, um, which we hope to see there. Um, somewhere at the end of this decade. Dan Whitehead, do you wish to come back? I'm happy for you to take a follow-up question. I, yes, maybe a, a supplementary chair on, on the final point there. So, um, which was actually a question I was going to come on to, the, the Bakerloo line and members and, and attendees of the committee may, may already be aware that there has been news stories at least indicating that the Bakerloo line is not of uh, the same high priority of the, the Mayor of London and TfL as it may previously have been um, in accordance with the submissions they made to the government recently on funding. Um, and I was wondering if this has been factored into uh, the transport considerations since that news. Okay, um, if I may, Colin, and I know I can see people also wants to come in at this point. Um, I think if, if I may, I'm, I'm going to forestall that particular question at this time, because clearly these are matters outside of the committee's immediate purview. Although it, it, it should be noted, of course, that these are <coughs> long-term investments. This, this application is an example of long-term investment. And, uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm reasonably confident that uh, if an applicant felt that um, they didn't wish to proceed, that uh, this item would not be, would not proceed to committee. So I'm going to forestall discussion on the Bakerloo line at this meeting, um, unless there is a specific reason why I would need to. So forgive me, Dan, on this occasion, I'm not going to take that question. I'm going to move on, if I may, to, to Councillor Williams. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Wayne, for that presentation. I just want to go back into the microclimate. Um, and you, men, you may have mentioned, in it, mentioned it, and if you did, I apologise. Um, but you said that cumulative uh, measures had been taken at the base of the proposed buildings, both standalone and cumulative. Did you say how strong those winds might be? And if you didn't, how strong will they be? Okay. Um, so the way wind... Um, the way it's been um, assessed is based on something called Lawson wind comfort criteria and they're usually the pedestrian level conditions um, so in the, in, the issue, in the cumulative scenario the conditions would improve because the Devonshire squared tower would be in place now yeah and should yeah okay does that answer your question councillor very good thank you very much uh, um, Councillor Livingston, I still see your digital hand up. That was previously, I, I assume. 
Thank you very much indeed. In that case, and if there are no questions to, to, to the officers, thank you very much Wing, uh, for, for your presentation. Um, I'll now move on. Um, now, does anyone wish to speak in objection to the application? And note for the objectors that this meeting is being live streamed and a recording will be available on the Council's YouTube channel. If you may choose to switch off your, your, your camera and address the meeting with audio only. When introducing yourself, please only give your first name and block or street that you live in, not the exact address. Now, the registered objectives that I've noted here is a Simon McKee. Sorry, Chair. There's actually no registered objectors. Um, uh -huh. okay. I understand that Mr. McKee was an objector at the last meeting, but ever uh -huh. since the uh, agreement or and the new addition has been added, they've withdrawn their objection. Ah, oh, really good, really good. And there, therefore, no other objection other than the notes we've received previously. Right. In that case, then, uh, so there are no objectors then? Sorry, uh, Joel, no, Chair, there's no objectors. Oh. Very good. In that case, I should move on. Um, uh, I, I, the, the following uh, uh, contributor, therefore, the applicant or the applicant agent, I assume are present. I've got here Craig Carson and uh, uh, Marie Claire Marsh from J Joseph Holmes. Is that right? Yes, Chair. And uh, Craig Carson, I'm here this evening. Very good. And is it Marie Claire Marsh also? Yes, yeah, she's present. She won't be speaking this evening. Very good. So you, you'll, 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 be, you'll be presenting this evening. In that case, what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to ask you, please, just to formally introduce yourself, and then I'll start the clock for three minutes. Okay. Good evening, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Craig Carson. I'm Development Director at Joseph Holmes. I'm also joined this evening by members of my project team. Very good. In that case, then you may begin your presentation now, and I'll, I will alert you at 30 seconds. You may begin. Well, good evening. Thank you for allowing me to speak this evening in respect of our application for the redevelopment of the Daisy Business Park. Some of you will recall we presented in early September, but the meeting was adjourned to allow further discussions with Veolia. As Wing has noted, I'm pleased to confirm that those discussions have been concluded and Veolia have removed their objection for the agreement being reached. This application supports the major regeneration proposals for the Old Kent Road, delivering new jobs, new homes and creating new desirable public spaces. Joseph Holmes is an award-winning B Corp certified developer based in Waterloo. We focus on creating beautiful, sustainable developments. This is evidenced by this development that will achieve one of the highest, if not the highest carbon reduction percentages of all the recent applications on the Old Kent Road. We understand and support the desire to make the Old Kent Road a successful community, building on its existing character and delivering tangible benefits for the local community. This development will significantly increase the employment floor space, almost doubling the number of jobs. The floor space will comprise light industrial and flexible SME workspaces with 10% being designated as affordable. We'll also continue to work with our existing occupiers on their relocation and present real opportunities for them to return. We'll deliver 219 new homes with 35% being affordable with a policy compliant tenure split. We've focused on delivering family homes as part of the social rented offering. The development has also been designed to be fully inclusive with all residents enjoying a single entrance and core, as well as sharing the community space. We recognise the importance that open space and play space has in bringing together communities and creating developments that people will want to live in. Our development will provide 45% of site areas, public realm, including the new garden square accessible to all. By working with the joining developers of Devonshire Grove, we've been able to design the square to maximize the area and further improve the permeability and connections for the existing and future residents. We've focused on the provision of play spaces for a wide range of age groups, delivering a policy compliant provision. We're also providing an additional community room for residents at the ground floor, which will also be available for neighboring Ledbury estate residents. This development will achieve a carbon reduction of 69%, which is double the level of reduction typically secured by policy. In addition, all residents will see a significant reduction in the cost of their energy bills as a result. Our plans represent a long-term investment into Southwark and the Old Kent Road, providing new homes and a significant uplift employment floor space in line with your aspirations for the area. We are able to start this development within 12 months from receipt of planning permission. Thank you again for your time this evening. And should you have any questions, my team and I would be happy to address these. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we've been time. Thank you very much. Uh, 
are there questions from the committee first of all they can put your digital hands up that'd be nice uh, uh councillor livingston thank you uh and, and thank you for your presentation craig um uh, you, you mentioned in the so a couple of quick questions. First of all, you mentioned your presentation about the community room space and about how uh, that would be accessible to local residents. Just confirm when you talk about Ledbury, do you mean the council, the 80 council homes at Sylvan Grove across the road? Because uh, there may well be some people there who don't, whilst they were former residents of Ledbury estate, don't recognise it as Ledbury. So, so just to clarify, that I think that's probably a yes, but I just want to, to double check that. Yes, thank you, uh, Councillor Livingston. That is correct, and apologies for the, the confusion. Uh, and the second one, and it does slightly go back to the points that, that Councillor Whitehead was mo uh, making earlier. Um, given there is a, a risk, and let's hope it is only a risk, of, of a slight delay to the delivery of the Bakerloo line, uh, and you're talking about starting in 12 months, whether whether that delay would have any impact on your plans? We've always, always recognised that the Bakerloo line extension will take uh, some years to come forward in fruition and therefore it's always in part of our plan that we would bring forward this development prior to the Bakerloo line extension. Uh, so therefore it doesn't impact on our proposals in the short term. You slipped that one in very neatly, Councillor Livingstone. Thank you very much. Uh, are, are, are there other questions from the committee? And uh, in that case, it's uh, um, in that case I will uh, move on. Thank, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, if I now move on to uh, the. Uh, Supporters, uh, is there a supporter that lives within 100 metres of the development site? Yeah, there is no registered supporters. Very good, thank you very much indeed. In that case, and last, of course, not least, um, can I invite, is there a, a ward councillor present? Um, I believe two councillor Evening Okoto and Michael Situ possibly are present. Are they present, wishing to speak? Uh, just just uh, whilst I'm ward councillor, I won't be speaking as ward councillor on this item. I believe they are probably both on, on the call for the next item, Chair. I see. I can see signs of situ here. OK, that's fair enough. In that case, there, there is not a ward councillor uh, to speak to this item. That's fine. Thank you very much. In that case, I will move on. Uh, so further, are there further comments to be made uh, I, uh, to officers? in view of the um, verbal submissions received this evening. Anyone wish to make any further comments? Great, well, that's good. Uh, can, I, can I seek your uh, opinions, any comments on what you have heard? And I may, may start with Councillor Williams, for example. Um, what's your view? Any comments you wish to make on, on the uh, application? Yes. Um... The comment oh, I'll, I'll take Councillor Whitton first then. There, there you are. Go, oh, okay. sorry, I thought you said my name. <laughs> no, William, so it's okay, but I'll take you first, don't you worry. Okay, One happy. <laughs> One happy. Um, what Colin said about uh, looking beyond the red line of the, the uh, application site, I find that very difficult because if we don't look within the red line and maintain the space standards within the red line, then each application will eat away even more space. And so we get an accumulation of lack of space. So we, we tend to then cram everything in together. And Wing's um, comment that it will, because they're so crammed into this little space, there'll be more community spirit I find quite disingenuous. I'm also very concerned about the distance between the two blocks, the Devonshire Square block and the uh, tall element of this application. 18 metres is very short distance to be apart. Um, I know from our experience of uh, in Rotherhithe near the Canada Water Library that Buildings don't have to be very close together to get a wind tunnel. 
And if they are that close together, it's going to be whistling through at a, such a high rate of knots, nobody will be able to open their windows or use their balcony or their winter garden. So those two uh, reasons, I'm not going to, to vote for this application. Thank you, Councillor, Whittem, uh, Councillor Williams. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I My question on the microclimate was answered adequately. Um, I recognise that um, we have to build up because we don't have the land to build out. I'm happy with what I've heard. At the moment, I'm mindful to approve. Thank you, Catherine Williams. Uh, Catherine Livingstone. Thank you, Chair. I mean, this is a development that uh, I've heard about for, for some time now, and the developers have been quite good at engaging the local community on this scheme. I mean, clearly, the issues that Councillor Whittam outlined in terms of space are, are, are you know, an important consideration, and obviously the height is, is quite considerable, albeit it's next to a, going to be next to a block that's, that's even taller. Um, However, you know, I, I think the good that comes out of this, and in particular, I know that most of the social housing is three bed homes, for example, which is, I, I think, certainly something that is, is praiseworthy and, and will enable families that need bigger homes living locally to be able to move on. To me, that feels as if it's a, a really positive part of this application. Uh, and uh, whilst Council Whitting is absolutely right, we shouldn't be trying to, to mix and match what was, what's happening with the development next door, the fact that this will create a, a large uh, open space that both developments can share as well as the council tenants across the road in, in Sylvan Grove, I think is a real positive of this scheme. And I know having talked to some of the local residents in Sylvan Grove, it's something they would welcome. So uh, I, I'm minded to approve, Chair. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Councillor uh, Whitehead. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I remain sceptical of the um, basis for justifying such a high density in the scheme. I think it, given the, the plan uh, and the policies indicate that a, a much lower density would be appropriate, it seems that this approval of this scheme alongside the Devonshire scheme sets a precedence for the entire Old Kent Road regarding density, and it will be difficult to rebut in future applications any other proposals which suggest similar densities. So that does concern me. However, on the flip side, I do understand the arguments in favour of uh, a significant number of affordable homes, particularly social rented homes. I think that has to be weighed up in against that. Um, and the valid point that density is necessary and you have to build upwards uh, given the limited amount of space. And so on balance, while I do think there is a broader, for me at least, conversation about what the, the point is of having um, a plan here, if the plan can be so significantly uh, contradicted on density, um, I'm minded to vote in favour. Thank you, Councillor Whitehead, thank you. Uh, Councillor Soames. You are on mute. You're still on mute. Uh, Gerald, are you able to unmute her, maybe? I don't believe I can. People have to unmute themselves, but I will oh, try okay. something. Oh, you're unmuted now. Oh, no, she's muted again. <laughs> you are muted for a moment there, Councillor Sons. <laughs> I think whilst Councillor Sons is trying to resolve that problem, maybe Councillor Bryan, you may wish to go. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I mean, I didn't mention it tonight. I've mentioned it before. I think people know where I stand in terms of my feelings about mixed communities. Um, that I think the term 
uh, turn your blinders played fairly fast and loose um, in these definitions. However, we've been through that, so there's no point bringing all that up again. I do have sympathy for what Cathal Wisdom, uh, Councillor Wisdom is saying about the, the open space. Um, but I think we've been striking that pretty much as we followed the bouncing ball all the way down the old Kent Road, to be honest with you. Um, I think it's not the best, probably, application that we've seen come forward, but I don't think there's enough wrong with it to, um, to vote for, to refuse, so I'm likely to vote in favour. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Councillor Morell. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, this is, I was one of those ones on the previous meeting where we discussed this. Um, look, uh, looking at the evidence that's come forward, I have sympathy with the, the, the space, green space, and I have sympathy with that, but down this particular part of the Old Kent Road, if we want to get the development, and to a degree, if we want to get that Bakerloo line train, we will need to, in put more um, homes in the area so and with the social homes and that and get the investment into the area I'm minded to vote for this because it is of reasonable quality I wouldn't say excellent quality but it does meet much some of our most of our criteria. Thank you very much uh, Councillor Morell. Uh, Councillor Soons are we able are you still there? Chair I believe Councillor Soons still has um some problems trying to unmute herself. Maybe if we take a short recess and she can log out and come back into the meeting, maybe that'll resolve the problem. Fair, fair enough, it's almost the hour anyway. Yes, so we'll recess for five minutes. We just, we'll re reconfirm at 8.30, 8.30.